Next, from the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute in Carbondale, we hear a talk by the Institute's director, David Yepsen, about the significance of the Iowa caucuses. As a journalist, Mr. Yepsen covered seven presidential elections. He shares his insights into the history of the Iowa caucus, why it remains the first state to vote on presidential candidates, and how he sees the upcoming election trending at this point. This runs about 50 minutes. What I'd like to do tonight is uh, talk with you about the Iowa caucuses and what they're doing and not doing. And I spent 34 years as a political reporter for the Des Moines Register and covered all or part of nine presidential campaigns. Uh, and then I came, I got tired of that and came here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so it's a timely thing for us to talk a little bit about uh, these caucuses because for better or worse, for right or wrong, they have had uh, a huge impact on the presidential selection process in our country. Uh, and I think they will again uh, this time. I've made a few notes to make sure I've, I, I cover everything. I, th I think, um, you know, the, the role that the caucuses have played in our politics is um, um, one of two things. Uh, they either slingshot somebody to the White House, uh, as they did with Jimmy Carter uh, in 1976, and arguably Bob, uh, John Kerry in, in 2004, or most commonly they winnow the field, as Howard Baker said. They take a field of six candidates and cut it down to about three who remain viable uh, on into New Hampshire. Uh, I used to say there were three tickets out of Des Moines to Manchester on the day after the caucuses, first class coach and standby. Uh, because no one who had finished worse than third uh, ever went on to win a major party nomination in Iowa, which worse than third in Iowa. Well, John McCain came in fourth and went on to the nomination, so that sort of knocked a little hole in my, maybe there's first class coach standby and baggage, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So it has had an impact. Now, it's a pretty controversial impact. Uh, the caucuses are actually, we can talk a little bit about the history of these events uh, and then uh, uh, how they came about and, and uh, uh, then what's happening there now and then save time for your questions. The caucuses really are a result of the Chicago Democratic Convention in 1968. Um, the, in 1968, the Democratic Party tore itself apart uh, over the issue of the Vietnam War. And, the, role, the party after that election uh, and after the riots in Chicago uh, came together and had a number of studies about what we do to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Uh, and one of the things that they decided to do was, well, we have to open up the party. We have to allow more people to participate. And so in Iowa, the, one of the things they did was they put a little more time between each of their various conventions and caucus events. <coughs> Uh, and, uh, and so if the party is going to have its national convention in August, uh, we probably need to have uh, our state convention in June and uh, district conventions in May and our county conventions uh, in March. And gee, that means we need to have our caucuses in February sometime. And, and actually one of the funny stories about the caucuses is uh, it, that time frame was determined by an old Gestetner mimeograph machine. There was a staffer for the Iowa Democratic Party uh, who actually timed how long it would take to run off various forms on this old mimeograph machine to sign in sheets and petitions and petitions to file amendments to the platform and all this stuff for the whole state. Um, in fact, he was telling me that story one time and we actually went over to the the, the building where the old state Democratic headquarters was and looked for that machine because I said, that's, a, that's an artifact of history. Uh, that, we ought to have that in our state historical library. Well, we couldn't find it. It had obviously gone out with the junk. But, but it's also true that it would, pretty quickly the Iowa Democrats figured that that would make Iowa the first place in the country where rank and file Democrats selected people who went on to pick national convention delegates. You could draw a line straight from an Iowa precinct caucus to the floor of the Democratic National Convention. Uh, and there were a few reporters who picked up on that. Um, uh, Johnny Apple uh, from the New York Times being the most important one. And I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, so in 1972, they had the caucuses. And a guy named George McGovern 
uh, was looking around to make a little bit of a splash before he went into the New Hampshire primary. And he was running against Ed Muskie, who was a heavy favorite. And uh, so McGovern decided, well, gee, I'll go to spend a little time in Iowa and try to get some media attention out of there. And one of the people who helped think that idea up was, uh, was Gary Hart, his young uh, campaign manager. And so off they came to Iowa, and they did spend some time there. And it wasn't a lot, but they spent some time. Uh, and they convinced the reporters that this was important to watch what grassroots Democrats were doing. Well, caucus night came, ice storm. And of course, the party regulars, who were all for uh, Ed Muskie, a lot of them stayed home. And the anti-war people, the real zealots, uh, turned out. And McGovern came in second and had what is the first surprising, surprisingly strong finish. Uh, and that became, uh, we've, we've seen a lot of that since that time. He beat the expectation. He came close to Muskie. Well, he went on to win the nomination. And that wasn't lost on um, a governor of Georgia named Jimmy Carter and his campaign manager, Hamilton Jordan. And they said, you know, if we're going to win in New Hampshire, we've got to go uh, campaign in Iowa. The media had looked at Iowa and said, you know, that told us something. It told us about the depth of the anti-war sentiment in the party. Uh, McGovern did well. He later went on to win the nomination. Muskie was a weak candidate. Um, and so reporters began reading the tea leaves. Carter came to Iowa. The rest is history. He ran. He finished with a plurality of the vote. Well, most of the voters were, uh, the plurality was, was actually uncommitted, but among the candidates, Carter finished um, ahead of everyone else and scored the great uh, victory that he led, then took all the way to the White House. And that set the template for every caucus fight um, since then. Uh, in 1976, Republicans also decided, the Iowa Republicans, well, we'll get in on this a little of this media attention, and they had, um, they just did sample straw polls in, oh, probably less than 100 precincts around the state. Uh, but it showed, surprisingly, that a guy named Ronald Reagan was running very close to uh, uh, Gerald Ford. And that came as a surprise. Well, not only did Carter uh, go to the White House, but obviously Ford lost, and Republicans looked back and said, you know, that told us something. It told us about how weak the incumbent president was. It told us about the rise of of, of Ronald Reagan. So it began to, again, cement the notion that uh, these caucuses were an important early test of candidate strength. Uh, and every cycle since then, uh, it has at one level or another uh, played some role. Um, oftentimes it elevates candidates out of obscurity. Uh, in uh, 1984, uh, Walter Mondale was the, was the heavy favorite and the question was who would come in second? Gary Hart did, by only a few votes. Uh, and he, it really elevated him to national stature, which he then threw away later. Um, in 1988, um, presidential campaign elevated Dick Gephardt, unknown Missouri congressman, uh, out of uh, obscurity and set him on, uh, elevated his profile. He didn't get the nomination, um, but it did elevate him to the point he went on and became minority leader of his, uh, of his party. So yeah, I look at the caucuses not only as something that t elevates candidates, but it just elevates people generally in their stature uh, inside the party. That's also where I met, in that campaign was where I met uh, Paul Simon. And uh, my favorite is Paul Simon's story. Some of you heard me tell this, but I want to share it. Uh, he, I'd interviewed him on public television, and he was heading downtown, which is on the edge of Des Moines, and then he was heading downtown to go to a, a UAW uh, sub-regional conference. Well, all the UAW leaders from all over the Midwest were there. We got done with the interview and I said, Senator, um, you know, I'm, uh, I've got a few more questions. I'll catch up with you after the UAW speech. And he said, well, listen, I'll just ride with you. He said, well, I don't have room for this whole staff. He says, forget it. He said, I'll just, well, they, can, they can follow. And I said, Senator, you're going to a UAW. I just looked at him. We're standing outside. Senator, you're going to a UAW meeting. <coughs> I'm driving a Volkswagen Rabbit with, <laughs> with Michelin tires. And he said, oh. And the staff said, well, thank you, Dave. Jeez. So <laughs> just, I, I just was smart enough to know I don't want to haul a candidate for the Democratic presidential up, nomination up to the UAW meeting in a Volkswagen car on Michelin tires. 
the steel workers in Iowa were always very generous about that. They had a sign posted that foreign cars and foreign tires are not welcome on this lot. And I always thought that was kind because it, you know, they did at least warn you that you know, if you park there, you're going to get your tires cut. <laughs> um, and I had, actually, I, and I also met Jean Simon there. And when she uh, wrote her book um, about the campaign, she had a great little vignette about the trials of, of campaigning there. And she was a little town of Garner, Iowa, and she wrote about what a dumpy motel this was. And she said it reminded her of the Bates Motel. <laughs> and I thought that was a cute story. And so I put that in my column. And uh, my column appeared on Monday morning. And I get to the office about 8 o'clock, and the phone rings. It's the owner of the motel, of the only motel in Garner, Iowa. <laughs> what are you doing saying something like, who is she to say that? I said, well, she, was just, you know, she obviously had a bad experience. <laughs> I said, Good, don't talk to me. Call her. It's in her book. Very irate. Uh, very irate with me. Very irate with her. <laughs> you know, I felt like saying you should clean up your motel. Uh, so anyway, those are a couple of favorite stories. I got several of them like that. But uh, the 88 campaign was also where uh, I had fun with uh, Senator Joe Biden. We were campaigning together, and uh, he was coming to a little town of Carroll, Iowa, which is about 10,000 people. And we arrived at 1130 at night. And you know, needless to say, there aren't a whole lot of places open to eat at 1130 at night in a small Iowa town. And we got to the hotel, and it was just the senator. I was along, there was a couple of aides, um, and he asked, we checked in and, and uh, the Carrollton Inn and uh, asked the, the, Biden asked the clerk, is there any place, buddy, we, any place where we can go get something to eat? And the clerk looked at his clock and said, well, you know, there's a, there's a Godfather's Pizza place just a few blocks away. And Biden said, oh, great, we can go there. Yeah. He said, well, can you call me a cab? The kid kind of looked at him and said, well, we don't really have that here. And, but he kid reaches into his pocket and pulls out his keys and says, here, take my car. And so Biden says, OK. But the kid says, you don't, you've got to be back by midnight because I've got a date. <laughs> Biden says, OK. And we get in this car, which is you know one of these jacked up things with dice and the little <laughs> furry balls. And, Here's Senator Biden at the wheel and a couple of us in the back. And off we go, roaring off down the streets of Carroll, Iowa. Went to Godfather's, ordered our food. And Biden, on the way out, said, you know, let's, we'll take the kid a pizza. So he bought a pizza for the guy. And we get back just in time. And he hands the, the get his keys and uh, the guy uh, and, and the pizza. And I thought that was kind of, kind of a cute story. And uh, before I left Iowa, in the last campaign, I, I, I wrote that story. And uh, it was really heartwarming. The next day, I got a call uh, from that clerk <laughs> uh, who had said that, uh, yeah, it's my, uh, my wife. <laughs> no. So it had a good, uh, a good, a good ending. You, won't, you don't see that kind of campaigning anywhere else. And in fact, you don't even see it that often in Iowa now. One of the problems with the caucuses is what were small, intimate meetings and a lot of retail politics has really become a big time media show. Um, and you have TV ads and staffers and, um, and hundreds of people who descend on the state. Millions of dollars are spent. Um, and it really has sort of changed the nature uh, of the event. Um, you know, there's a principle that some of you scientists may, may have heard of it. Uh, it's called the Leeuwenhoek effect. And it, it's, it, it comes from the fact that the, how does the heat of the eyeball through a microscope change the performance of the specimen below. And it's named after one of the Dutch inventors of the microscope. And that's true of campaigns, because clearly the media intensity on these specimens below <laughs> changes the very nature of the event itself. And, and so the caucuses, I think, have lost some of their intimacy <coughs> as a small neighborhood meeting. Um, and I kind of miss that. Um, because I enjoyed being able, as a kid reporter in Iowa, to be able to hop in the back seat of a car with George Herbert Walker Bush or Jimmy Carter. I went to a press conference with Jimmy Carter's once in 1976. It was a Sunday afternoon. I was the only reporter that showed up. I mean, so he just sat there, and we, he ate grapes, and I kind of interviewed him. Um, those things just don't happen anymore. And uh, I'm 
personally uh, grateful that I've had um, that experience in my life because I've really been able to meet some, some wonderful people. But the arc goes on. Uh, 92, the events weren't too uh, important because Tom Harkin was in the race. Uh, in 88, let's go down through this list a bit, don't forget anything. In 88, you saw the rise of religious conservatives when Pat Robertson beat George uh, Herbert Walker Bush in the caucuses, uh, which told us something. 2000, uh, uh, Al Gore and Bill Bradley, uh, George Bush won on the Republican side, Gore won handsomely on the Democratic side. Uh, in 04, I mentioned Kerry was in fourth place at this stage in the caucuses. A month later, he went on to, to win it and went all the way to the White House. And I think the, the real epic battle in the Iowa caucuses occurred um, four years ago when Barack Obama won. Uh, some of you, John, I know that some of you were there campaigning um, for Obama. Uh, and, and really nothing tops that race because it was the, one of the epic political battles uh, uh, that I've seen. Uh, Obama, Hillary Clinton, John Edwards, uh, millions spent uh, and, and led to really one of the most protracted races for the Democratic presidential nomination in, uh, in history. Um, and so you have to look at the caucuses as something that, uh, that have had an impact, for better or worse, um, and, and that are important to watch because, because of that. Um, oftentimes I'm asked, uh, why Iowa? Well, they started it. Uh, no, it's not carved in stone. Isn't there a better way to do this? Yes. Uh, the trouble is what keeps Iowa uh, going and what keeps New Hampshire going is political inertia. The country cannot agree on a solution. Uh, and when you ever you talk about solutions, uh, you've got to remember the rule of unintended consequences. I mean, uh, if you love money in politics, uh, you'll love a regional presidential primary or a national presidential primary. Um, and so there's, the country just can't come to a, a solution about a different way to do it. And uh, Iowa, and particularly New Hampshire, could have dug in their heels and said, you know, we're going to keep going first. And, uh, and so for better or worse, that is the way it, uh, it goes. I don't know if, how long that will occur. Every year somebody says, this will be the last time these caucuses are important. I said, yep, you may be right. The country may decide on a better way to do it. There certainly are better ways to do it. Um, but the fact is Iowa and New Hampshire, one of them that won't go over with Iowa and New Hampshire is to simply shift it to another state. Because all that's going to do is move all, you know, no state is typical, it's just going to move the media show and the money and all that uh, to another state. And um, that's not a reform that people in Iowa and New Hampshire are going to buy into. So um, it's, it's part of our, of our political history and it's had an impact. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the events uh, this cycle, uh, this race right now in Iowa is a jumble. It looks like a pile of spaghetti. And I think it's important for, for, to remember as observers, a couple things are important. First of all, at this stage four years ago, Mike Huckabee was in about third place. And these things tend to break late at the end. 60% um, in, in the last Bloomberg poll of Iowa caucus goers, which was taken two weeks ago, mid-November, 60% of caucus goers said, Republican caucus goers said they could be persuaded to change their mind. Only about a third had firmly made up their mind. So this thing is up for grabs. If you look at the polling, and the best place I've found to look at polling of the caucuses is a website called Real, realclearpolitics.com. So if you're a political junkie, which everyone in this room is, um, you, know, you can go on yourself and see what I'm talking about in those trend lines. They just look like lines of spaghetti there, up and there down. And, uh, and it's impossible call, uh, to call this race at this point because what I've described is the, the undecided phenomenon. Caucus goers in both parties are, uh, they are higher incomes, they're better educated, they're very motivated. I mean, if you think about it, actually going to a caucus is a more motivated political act than even writing a campaign check to somebody. Um, and so they watch issues, they watch debates, they pay attention to things. And when we have these uh, disruptive events, Rick Perry's performance in the debate, oops, uh, Herman Cain's uh, problems right now, that has an impact on what caucus scores do. Republicans and Democrats alike, something like that happens in a campaign, they don't immediately move to another candidate, they go undecided for a while. And after all these years, most of them know that um, they want to watch this thing play out until the very end before they start 
making their decisions. So, no predictions. Uh, right now, the last polling that I saw, uh, Gingrich is uh, in first place, uh, followed by Romney, uh, Ron Paul, and Herman Cain is fading, um, which mir sort of mirrors what's happening in, uh, in some of the national polling. Um, I think the dynamic has got to be that Romney can win this thing. He's now decided to make a play for Iowa, and in doing so, he follows the model that George Bush, the first George Bush, set in 1980. Um, he went into Iowa, and the, the Republican field was a jumble, like it is this time, and he won with a plurality, beat even Ronald Reagan, who came in second, because the Republican conservatives split their votes. Uh, Phil Crane, uh, Ronald Reagan, John Connolly, uh, they divided up the conservative vote, and that enabled the more moderate um, George H.W. Bush to win with the plurality. Romney is going to try to produce, perform the same miracle. He needs to have the conservative vote split uh, among a variety of candidates and uh, so that he can try to win with a, with a plurality. And it's plausible. And the risk is probably worth it because if he stays out of Iowa, he loses and will try to make a stand in New Hampshire where he's ahead in the polls. But he will be then fending off the winner of the Iowa caucuses who will have all kinds of momentum and media attention and energy. And that can be a tough you know, tsunami that hits a candidate who has not campaigned uh, in Iowa. Uh, so he doesn't want to let somebody get uh, an edge on him. And if he wins Iowa, then he does what uh, John Kerry did in 2004. He starts to roll up the nomination pretty quickly. Republicans have changed their national rules. It might make it a little more difficult. They've, they're going now more and more to proportional representation. So instead of winner-take-all primaries, that we saw last time, there will be more of them that allocate their delegates based on the size of the vote. So it's, it's not inconceivable to see a Republican fight this time that is as protracted as the Democratic one was uh, last time. Um, Romney's got some problems, though. Uh, he's just in generally sort of plateaued at about 25 percent and can't seem to break through with that. He doesn't really excite that many people. Um, uh, but he's, he's got a pretty firm 25%. A big question is what will his, uh, how will his religious faith play? Um, it's very difficult to get to the bottom of that. Uh, it's hard to poll on it. Uh, we know anecdotally that there are many uh, religious conservatives who consider his faith as a Mormon uh, a cult, who consider that a cult. And they say they couldn't uh, accept um, that kind of a person in the White House. In fact, Four years ago, there was some polling that suggested that Romney's faith was a, a greater liability to him than Obama's race. And we know there's racism in the electorate. So particularly in the southern states, where your social conservatives are even farther to the right than they are in, in Iowa, uh, that could be problematic. So it's one of the things we're all watching for, is, and it's difficult to try to, to get a handle on just how much it's there. We know it's there. Uh, it's just how, how bad is it and, and, and uh, how much will it hurt him. Um, the wild card person in this race in my mind right now is Ron Paul. Um, he has uh, a loyal cadre of supporters, particularly younger supporters. Uh, it reminds you a little bit of the Obama campaign four years ago of young people who are coming to Iowa to knock on doors and you know, sleep on the floor and, and to try to turn out a vote for him. His campaign has not been treated very seriously by the media because everybody says, look, he's not, there's no way he's going to be a Republican presidential nominee. And that's probably true. But I don't think the Republicans can ignore uh, the Ron Paul faction of their party anymore. It's there, and if you think about it, it's been there since 1912 with the Taft-Roosevelt fight, the internationalists versus uh, uh, the isolationists, uh, Eisenhower uh, in, in 50, and, and Taft in 52. Um, I mean, th this is a fault line that has run through the Republican Party for a long time, and, you know, the party is, is testing it again. Uh, I don't think Ron Paul can be the nominee, uh, but I think he's going to surprise some people uh, along the way uh, because he's got money and he's got loyal supporters and he's got a message that a lot of them like. Um, keys to winning Iowa, spending time there, but spending time in the state uh, campaigning isn't enough. You've got to have a message. There have been candidates who have spent a lot of time in Iowa who don't do well because they're not really, it may be retail politics, but they're selling something people aren't buying. I mean, Lamar Alexander comes to mind. Spent an awful lot of time there. 
the people who win Iowa are ones who have a message that sells. Uh, and so uh, just because you spend time there and organize and even be, if you spend a lot of money on media, that's no guarantee that you're going to win. And, um, and so you, we need to keep an eye on a, a candidacy like Paul's because he's got a message that does appeal um, to a lot of Republicans um, and, and to a lot of people who are not Republicans. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, and then we'll throw it open to your questions, religious conservatives. I've started to come to the conclusion that maybe we're all media people and all of us who watch this are making too much out of, out of social conservatives. Um, you know, about 60%, yeah, 60% um, of the Republican caucus goers, I'm sorry, 43% of Republican caucus goers told the Bloomberg poll that they consider themselves born again or evangelical, 43%. Well, that means that close to 60% are not. Um, you had a similar sort of number last time. Um, there's anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of those Republican caucus scores who aren't social conservatives. Um, even among social conservatives, if you look at the polling uh, on issues, the overwhelming issue that most concerned to people who identify themselves as social conservative is jobs in the economy. If you ask all caucus scores what are, what are the most important issues they face, the, facing the, the country, abortion, gay marriage, way at the bottom. So, while those issues are important, I'm not sure they're driving this whole narrative. Uh, reporters are watching it because why? Reporters and politicians always fight the last war. And last time, Mike Huckabee rallied the social conservatives and won Iowa. Well, this time, nobody's rallying the social conservatives yet. Uh, they have decided they can't agree among themselves on who they want to support, so they may be, they may be split. Uh, and, the, and even among social conservatives, you've got many of them who say what's important here is this economy uh, and jobs and things like um, immigration, gay rights, um, abortion just aren't the drivers uh, that they once were. So my, I, don't, I can't predict the outcome. Keep an eye on Ron Paul and maybe we're making too much uh, out of the, the, uh, the, the vote delivering capability of the social conservatives. Uh, we'll see. Come see me in mid-January when I get back, and we'll, uh, we'll see where I'm right or where I'm wrong. Now with that, I want to <clears throat> I want to get a sip of water. Um, I want to throw this open to your questions or comments. Um, I could go on all night about telling these old, uh, old war stories. Steve? Well, a procedural question. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the process. Maybe some, maybe more people here are, but can I be a Democrat and pick up a Republican, become a Republican caucus goer? or how close is each party's process? Per question on process. Can you pick up a Democrat, a Republic, if you're a Democrat, can you pick up a Republican ballot? And the answer is yes, but you have to say you are a Republican. In some precincts, they'll require you to be a registered Republican. Uh, there isn't a great tradition of people crossing over from one party to the other. There it happens anecdotally, but most people in Iowa play in their own sandbox uh, when it comes to caucuses. Um, just a brief note about caucuses. Caucuses are a neighborhood meeting, okay? Um, it's just like this, they would get together, people in both parties, they get together typically now at a school gym or something like that, and, um, and the two parties do it a little differently. And the Republican side, it is, a, it is a ballot, it's a straw vote. You put a name in a hat, or you mark a ballot, put it in, and it's counted. Um, on the Democratic side, they do something uh, called measuring what are called delegate equivalents and um, where votes are counted, but then they're, then they're projected how many delegates they would win. Now, why do Democrats do that? Well, they're Democrats. They like rules, and they're very elaborate. But it's also because Iowa and New Hampshire in 1983 cut a political deal. Two states were fighting over who goes first. And the two state party chairs met and said, Dave Nagel from Iowa, George Bruno from New Hampshire, and said, we got to quit this. Let's cut a deal. New Hampshire has the first primary. Iowa has the first caucus, which will happen seven days ahead of New Hampshire's primary, at least. And Iowa Democrats will do nothing that makes their contest look like a primary. So if the Democrats went to this system of dropping uh, names in a hat, 
uh, that causes a great deal of heartburn among New Hampshire Democrats. And so there's a fear that they would then set off this war, uh, New Hampshire fearing Iowa. Now, it doesn't seem to bother New Hampshire Republicans, but it does on the Democratic side. So that's established tradition. It's also the reason why Iowa's never gone to a, a presidential primary, um, which a lot of people think would be stronger. And the answer is, Iowa goes to a primary, you're setting up a fight with, uh, with New Hampshire. And frankly, this, this business of, of caucus meetings are great organizing tools for the parties. Um, you know, you see 2,500 precincts in the state, everybody goes out, cold night, Republicans, Democrats. Well, that gives the party wonderful lists of names of people they can go to for contributions, for door knockers, uh, and it has had an impact on Iowa politics. Uh, we chart the birth of the modern day Democratic Party in Iowa, I do, to 1972. It started generating, it was a Republican state up until that point for the most part. This started generating a lot more interest on the Democratic side, uh, and as a result, that and other factors um, contributed to the rise of the Democratic Party. And, and Iowa now is one of the two most, one of the half a dozen most competitive, evenly balanced states. Uh, in the country, and, and that's in no, due in no small part to the caucuses. So both parties sort of say, why would we want to change it? Um, yes, sir. Uh, you said earlier that going to a caucus is a more involved uh, political activity than, than even uh, writing a campaign check. So could you give like a brief overview of you know, like who the caucus goers are? Are they different from party to party, or are they changing with time? Um, Caucus goers in both parties are better educated than the electorate as a whole. They have higher incomes, um, and they're just those are two big things that make them different. Uh, a lot of criticism is made of Iowa in that the state is not typical of the rest of the country. It's 97 percent white, uh, and that's that's all true. Uh, but my point in, in response to that is the activists in each party who show up look a whole lot like they do in their party around the country. I mean, if you went to, you take a look at the floor of the Democratic National Convention, looks an awful lot like uh, the meeting hall at the, uh, uh, the Democratic Caucus. You have labor, you have feminists, you know, you've got, you've got all the different civil rights activists. I mean, you've got all kinds of people who are uh, who are active in the Democratic Party who show up. And the same is true on the Republican side. I mean, you go to a Republican caucus, what do you have? Fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, uh, Second Amendment activists. Um, you know, those are the people that form the Republican Party. So while the state isn't typical, uh, these, these grassroots activists uh, do, do represent, are, are sort of surrogates for their, uh, their whole party. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, if you think about writing a check, is something a lot of people do. And, and mail it in, and that doesn't, you know, it takes maybe five minutes. Going out you know, in a caucus where you've got to pay attention and you find out where it is and you get there, and, it's, and it oftentimes, pick on the Democratic side, you've got to stand around for a long time. Um, that's, pretty, that's a pretty intense, motivated act of political engagement. Yes, sir? Is it true that if oh, I go no. to my, okay. <laughs> Is it true that if I'm an Iowa voter and I go to my district's caucus and I bring the best cookies that uh, my candidate will get the most votes? No. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's always a joke. Some of you go eat somebody's food and then um, vote for somebody else. Uh, but it, there is a little bit of a church social flavor to some of these meetings. You know, you're talking. This is a this is a meeting of your neighbors. I mean, the term caucus. Its origin is thought to be an Algonquin term. It's a Native American term for, that meant a meeting of tribal leaders. Well, this is the Democratic tribe. Here we have the Republican tribe. Here are the leaders locally, and they are meeting uh, to talk about party affairs. And they draft platforms and talk about rules and who's going to get out the vote and, and a fundraiser and somebody brings cookies and lemon bars and and all that, and hot chocolate, and uh, um, so it, it, it is. It's a little bit of a church social kind of flavor to a lot of us. Some of them are pretty big now. Uh, again, you know, the victim of their own success. You know, they meet in a school auditorium with 2,000 people in it for, in some Democratic caucuses last time. But the cookies are important. <laughs> Other questions?
Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about Taft and Roosevelt uh, running against each other in 1912, where uh, Roosevelt, leading the Progressive Party, was able to actually come in second place that year. Do you think that, and you know, again, in 1992 and 1996, he had Ross Perot. Do you think there are any just political events right now that would uh, bring about another formidable third party or third candidate? Um, uh, no, but it's, it's certainly being talked about. I mean, the t people, both ends of the political spectrum are incredibly angry. Uh, the, you have, on the right, you have the Tea Party. On the left, you have the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, if you listen to what they're saying, a lot of it sounds the same. And in fact, the political spectrum is a circle. <laughs> and on many, now they, they would disagree vehemently with that analysis. They wouldn't think they have much in common with each other, but in fact, they do. Question, could somebody bring that together? And the answer is no. Um, Organize, we're a two-party country. I mean, I think that's the way it was started out. We're sort of hardwired to be a two-party uh, country. If you think about it, the last time a third party became a major party, it took the most, one of the most seismic events in our nation's history, the Civil War, to make it happen when the Republicans replaced the Whigs. And we just don't have any, I mean, as bad as things are in this country right now, there's just nothing that uh, big to, to, make a th to make one of the parties replace the other. I mean, typically the history of third party movements are they rise up, and they do have an impact, and that's why I think it's worth paying some attention to them. Uh, yes, Ross Perot didn't win, but it's also true he put the national debt and deficit uh, on the political agenda in the country, and during the, later, during, both parties picked up on that, including Bill Clinton, who wasn't real happy about doing it, uh, but they balanced the budget. And I, think, I don't think that would have happened if it hadn't been for the impact Ross Perot had. The two parties start trying to find a way, how are we going to seek these votes? And they'll, sometimes they'll get pulled to the left or the right too much, which is one of the downsides of the caucuses, where you have all these activists pulling on each, each end. But they don't, um, they don't ever get a, the, 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 the third party movements just don't have enough juice to become something more than, than a... Uh, uh, a, a, a movement. They just, they don't last. But smart, I think they do have an impact. Ralph Nader, uh, I think, had an impact on the environment. Um, the socialists in the 1930s, I think, led to help lead to the creation of social security. Um, why? Because the new major parties look at these things and they start stealing some of their ideas. Sometimes it's not healthy. I mean, I think one of the reasons the Republican Party moved to the right totally turned its back on its Lincoln heritage and moved to the right was in, because of George Wallace in 1968 and 1972, and just turned the party around, completely away from its heritage, uh, and, and really played on the racial prejudices. So George Wallace, for better or worse, did have an impact on American politics because of what he did to the, the major party dialogue. Other questions or comments? Olga, here, wait, let me get to the microphone. Thank you. You didn't mention Huntsman, and he's edged eight percent from one percent. Do you think he might surprise anyone? Uh, well, anything is possible, Olga. Uh, I don't think John Huntsman. Um, you know, he's not doing anything in Iowa, so don't expect him to do anything there. He does seem to be picking up some in uh, in New Hampshire, but I, I, I just I don't think he's breaking through, and he's sort of a kind of a he's an attractive candidate sort of a boutique candidate, but he's an example of what I was talking about earlier, that there are people who, if you run for president, chances are you lose, but your national stature will be enhanced. And that's another reason to keep an eye on the results in places like Iowa, New Hampshire, because you see political leaders who emerge out of that. I mentioned Gephardt earlier. I think John Huntsman um, could easily be a secretary of state in a Republican presidential administration, for example. Uh, and he, he's running a, a, a classy race, and not a, offending uh, other people. And, you know, as a new president tries to solidify his administration, I mean, president, a President Mitt Romney could do worse than picking a John Huntsman to be a Secretary of State. And that would not have occurred, I don't think, had, not, had Huntsman not, uh, not run. The other reason some people run is to increase their book and lecture fees after they lose. <laughs> yes, sir. I want you to use the microphone. Okay. You mentioned earlier that uh, you think that Ron Paul has the potential to surprise some people. Um, what do you think it would do if he were to finish second or maybe even 
potentially win the Iowa caucuses, what would that do for New Hampshire and setting up the rest of the primaries down, down the road? Um, I think it would really rattle the party to have that happen. But I don't think it would fundamentally change the direction of the race. It would be a little bit like Pat Buchanan and his candidacy, sort of the same constituency. Um, it, it will have an impact. Uh, the nominee will have to start talking you know, more, try to appeal to those voters. Uh, Romney's already got that problem, trying to reach out to Tea Party voters. And I just don't think you see him moving that far to the right if he hopes to win uh, in, in November. But it would be a gee whiz moment. What does this mean? Uh, why did this happen? And people would, some critics would say, well, that just proves that Iowa's too extreme, uh, that small groups of people can have a big impact. Uh, but as I said earlier, you watch these events for tea leaves about what's going on in national politics. And I think the fact he's doing well and could conceivably, I think he could come in second. Um, and uh, if, if that happens, then people are going to say, well, what's he all about? What's he saying? And all of a sudden, the issues he's talking about, um, the gold standard, uh, getting out of, a, of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, I think those are going to get more discussion in the, in the national debate as a result. Yes? Let me, let me. Okay. I was uh, about the, the far left uh, in the Democratic Party. A lot of them aren't happy with Obama because of certain things. I was wondering, I thought maybe there might be some kind of token opposition to Obama. Some candidate would just show that, you know, a certain part of our party isn't really happy with what's going on. I was wondering your thoughts on that. Well, that's true. Uh, Democrats, a lot of Democrats on the left are unhappy with Obama over a lot of things. Put entitlements on the on the table, uh, single-payer health care, uh, a lot of unhappiness. But one of the uh, learning experiences for Democrats was when uh, Ted, Edward Kennedy challenged Jimmy Carter in 1980. And that is one of the things that arguably cost Carter the presidency against Reagan. It cracked the Democratic base. It cracked the Democratic Party. And they never really did get that uh, healed up. Uh, you saw Democrats tear themselves apart in 68 over the war. And uh, you know many liberals were so angry uh, that they didn't want to help Hubert Humphrey. And they got Nixon. I'm sure they're happy that but they did that to American history. Um, and so I think Democrats, that's still a formative experience inside the Democratic Party. There are many people who remember that. And I think, uh, uh, I don't think there's much stomach for that. Uh, and I think plus Obama, uh, despite the problems that he had, I think uh, he has, has, like Clinton, uh, did a good job of trying to keep the leaders of that base happy. Now you still have Democrats who say, uh, you know, I'm really unhappy, I'll, I'll vote for him, but that's all I'm going to do. And if that happens, you know, there's a ch chance he could lose. Because in the battleground states like Iowa or Ohio, uh, you know, he, he's just got to have more energy. I mean, he's still talking about trying to carry Virginia. Um, so I, I, think, I think you're right, the left is unhappy. They're not so unhappy that they would try to challenge Obama, uh, but they, their, their decision to stay home and not get involved uh, could cost him the, the White House. And another thing to watch are under 30-year-old 30, under 30 voters, millennials. Younger voters are just have tuned out. I, mean, I, I think younger voters, Americans generally are impatient, but younger voters especially um, have very short attention spans. And so they all went out. And, and voted for Barack Obama, and then two weeks later, when they didn't have a $70,000 a year job, they were unhappy. <laughs> and so they've tuned out. They tuned out of the 2010 elections. There wasn't that big a presence in the 2011 elections, although Democrats did make some gains in places like Ohio. So that's why I think we're going to have a very, uh, a very close presidential race this time. And one of the things to watch is what you've just described. What does the left do? And as part of that, what do younger voters do? It's a good question. Other questions or comments? Don? Iowa's been, Republicans have been described as, as you, I think you mentioned earlier, as being by and large socially conservative as well as fiscally conservative. And yet we you know, see Herman Cain with his problems and, and even um, Newt Gingrich with his problems in the past, with his infidelities and so on, and his marriages. 
And how does that square, based on your observation, with the social conservatism that's in Iowa when these guys, you know, at least so far, haven't fallen off the, and Gingrich is, in fact, increasing? That's a good question. And you, you could have had Ronald Reagan to that mix, too, because he had a divorce. Right. Um, the answer to that is um, some of you in this room may be social conservatives. Some of you may be evangelicals or have had a born-again religious experience. I always have that same question. And, and the answer is many people who, who are evangelicals or who have had a born-again religious experience did so after a great trauma in their life, after they themselves reached the depth, divorce, bankruptcy, sub alcoholism, drug abuse. So they have been through their own crucible in their lives and they, that's how they found the Lord. And uh, so they are quite forgiving. Uh, and, and especially if there is reason to believe that this happened in the past, that someone has not doing it now, and that uh, has been forgiven. Uh, I think Newt Gingrich has pretty effectively to date offered that explanation. Herman Cain has not, and the result is Gingrich's numbers have gone up, Cain's are going down. And so I think that's, that's the difference. Because uh, I used to, a lot of people have that question, and, and it, that is, it just, if it isn't current, if it's in the past, sort of, most voters do give a political candidate, there is some statute of limitations uh, with, with how you punish a politician for transgressions years ago. Um, and and I, I do think that's, that's my conclusion from having watched that, starting with Pat Robertson's campaign uh, when, when he did so well. Um, and I remember telling him one time, I said, uh, uh, Reverend, I'm spending more time in church as a reporter than I ever did uh, growing up and, and uh, covering you. And he said, well, good. It'd probably be good for you. <laughs> And uh, I certainly did learn an awful lot. Uh, you cover, if you want to cover Republican politics, uh, you, uh, uh, you learn to go to church a lot. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. I, uh, in the 19, one of Chuck Grassley's U.S. Senate campaigns, uh, we, I was at an event. We got done. It was on a Sunday night. And I had to file my story, and so I filed. And was, the, the, the rally, the, the dinner was in one room, and I was filing from the bar. I got done filing. I always had a rule: I never drank when I uh, when I wrote, or just I just don't do that. And uh, I thought, well, I'm done writing. We're done for the day. We're going home. Um, so I had a a drink at the bar. Got done. Hop in the back seat. Um, Grassley said, let's go to that church down the road. I mean, he, he knows every Baptist church in Iowa. And uh, I leaned over to the, the, <laughs> the aide and I said, you know, I thought, I thought we were done. I've been in a bar. I shouldn't, it's on my breath. I can't walk in there. And he said, just sit in the back. If anybody says anything, tell them you're there to be saved. <laughs> uh, I did sit in the back, but no one, <laughs> I was careful not to breathe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lots of old stories. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Well, we're, John, last question. Here. Do you know what percentage of Iowa uh, are Mormons? Percentage of Iowans are Mormons. I think that has some impact on, on uh, Mitt Romney. Yes. Um, and in fact, I, uh, Orrin Hatch, when he ran, told me that he thought there were about 20,000. Um, and it is true that Romney, there is some upside. You go to Romney's events and you do see uh, uh, members of the church who have shown up who aren't usually active. Um, so it's worth paying attention. It's not all a downside proposition. One of the things that you watch as a journalist covering the caucuses is who's bringing in the new people. Um, and that's been a theme since 1972. I mean, McGovern had the anti-war people, and Pat Robertson had the, uh, the religious conservatives, and Obama had young people. And, you know, it could be important to, to Mitt Romney to get a few thousand members of his church to come out and, and support him. Or it certainly could take some of the edge off of the bigots who don't care for uh, people in his faith. It's not a substantial population, but the, the trek to Utah did go across southern Iowa and left uh, church members uh, in its wake. Is 
also Yes, Huntsman's also a monk. Well, this is, the, uh, any other questions? Okay, our, our time is up, and so I want to let you all free for your rest of your evening. This has been great. Thanks for coming. I enjoyed this. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.